to relationships, identity plays a huge role um, where we have a relationship with other people. Uh, so much so when we are in a marital relationship or a significant other or in an intimate type of uh, relationship. Um, a lot of people... A lot of people associate identity with their either their title at work or um, they identify themselves as a mother or a father or um, or other things. And what I've noticed throughout my years in practice that um, a lot of people, when they have difficulties and, and troubles, it sits in their identity. Um, a lot of people, and I've been saying a lot, <laughs> I've been saying a lot of people a lot, well, because there are a lot of people, um, are not familiar with basic needs. And when it comes to identity and relationships, um, they're not even aware that they have the option of addressing their needs, uh, whether the relationship is the, with a significant other, a spouse, or a boss uh, uh, at work, or your neighbor. Uh, because when it comes to relationships, we have relationships with everything that surrounds us, not just with a significant other. And when it comes to self-identity, when it comes to individual identity, in a relationship with others, uh, very few people are aware of, of the fact that I, this identity not only interact with each other, but they overlap. Like for example, this is one person and this is another person. We overlap the identity, sometimes more, sometimes less, depends. And all of this in between right here, I'm gonna need a third hand. All of this in between when it comes to uh, relationships, it, it becomes um, a new identity, uh, so to speak, is the relationships identity that has a purpose and a role. An individual has a purpose and a role in life uh, as, as part of life, as part of the fabric of life. Uh, but when in relationship, this, this interaction over here in the middle becomes, becomes um, has a role and a purpose and, and, and a driver. And fate can enlighten us a little more on when it comes to relationships in marital, familial and, and marital uh, relationships. And I'll be back uh, with identity, the self-identity and the relationships identity, fate. Thanks, Carmen. So you brought up um, really three different things and all of them are important and they all play a part. So when it comes to identity, you were speaking in, for a moment about roles that people may see themselves as a husband or as a wife or a mother or a father. And when we see ourselves as a role, the role doesn't always um, let us know the traits. Do we want to be a protective father? Do we want to be a generous wife? What kind of person or what in what kind of way would a person want to do the role that they're in? So the way that I look at identity is not as a noun. I look at identity as a series of adjectives. And the great thing about the series of adjectives is that a person can reinvent who they need to be in that given role at any given time. So a phrase that I use from one of my mentors is to adjust yourself to fit the situation that you're in. Maybe normally a person could be a kind, generous mother, but maybe a situation will come up where they need to become a protective and strict parent, something like that. So by using adjectives rather than nouns, to create that sense of identity, what happens is it gives more, it gives more adjustability and flexibility into a particular role so that a person doesn't become stuck or limited and instead is empowered to be whatever it is they need to be in the moment that they're in. 
you also brought up needs and I think I need some water, <laughs> um, which I don't have. So <clears throat> you brought up needs and you're right that a lot of times the way our emotions work is we feel emotions when we get what we don't need. If someone yells at us and we don't need that, we'll feel an emotion about that. If, um, if dinner's late and we don't need, the, you know, it late, we'll feel hunger. Now the screen's really messing around. And, and that's triggering us. We don't want the hunger. So a lot of the way that the emotions actually work is they trigger off of what we don't want or what we don't need. And so a lot of times when people go to communicate about that, they will often say what they don't want. You're late, which is what I don't want, right? You're yelling at me, which is what I don't want. And it can take a little practice, but it's definitely a learnable skill to pause for a moment before we communicate what we don't want and just take a moment and think about what is it that we do want? Because if a person can actually ask another person for what they do want, and to better yet, if we can skip telling that person what we don't want, we have a much better opportunity to get what we want. A lot of people by saying what we don't want, make the other person feel like they just did something bad or wrong and it can make them feel defensive. In fact, there's actually a method being taught that I don't use. And it's not that it's a problem, it's just that I don't feel that it's enough. So the method that's out there that I don't use is when people say, when you're late, that makes me feel, you know, neglected, disrespected, or whatever it is, and I'm letting you know what I don't want. And, and people are taught to use that method. When you do this, I feel that. And so what's missing for me in that part is the part of what I do want. And that's the critical part in my book is to let the other person know I would like you to call me if you're going to be late. Would that be okay? I would like it if you would be on time. I would like it if you would lower your volume when you're in the house. I would like it if we could not talk about politics until after 4 p.m. every day. I would like it, whatever it is that we want. If a person can just, you know, the game Monopoly where it says, don't pass, go, just go directly to jail. Well, in this case, in my book, it's not going to jail, it's going to freedom. Skipping over what we don't want, go going directly to what we do want. And that offers the other person a much easier opportunity to just say, okay, and do it. What do you think about that? Yes, you, you bring out a, a very good point. Uh, what I'd like to add to that is that the reason people communicate what they don't like and what they don't want has to do with the way the nervous system works, especially I'm going to bring out again the amygdala. The amygdala is it, two little sizes of a pea, green pea uh, uh, in the brain that the amygdala's function is to, to save you, to, to, protect, uh, to protect you when, when, when your life is in danger. Like some, for example, if someone without their amygdala functioning, they will not be able to defend themselves. They, they will be a doormat, they will be a vegetable, so to speak. So the amygdala is very important and it's very important for us to be able to react to defend ourselves. But what happens throughout time, amygdala, the way the amygdala works, it registers stronger emotions. Yeah, you see, we want, and we want to become friends with the amygdala. Well, <laughs> we do want to become friends with the amygdala. So when we understand that the amygdala registers stronger emotions quickly as opposed to fear, and then when we don't like something, we fear that's going to happen again, and we don't want it, and we have a, a strong reaction, which amygdala will register it. But if we learn to behave and express with pos strong positive emotions, then the amygdala will register those. If you think 
of it, uh, um, you can think of it as amygdala being a hard drive that you're storing uh, both software and data uh, on. So this is how it works. And with, especially with the feelfulness techniques, we learn how to feel and register positive, healthy emotions. So then the amygdala doesn't get triggered when something we don't like happens. And there's been extensive studies done on um, and uh, people that are uh, pro, uh, more optimistic people as opposed to pessimistic people. And they've seen that they were shown uh, traumatic uh, pictures, traumatic events pictures. And people uh, prone to optimism, uh, their amygdala will not light up as it would light up with uh, pessimistic prone people. So this clearly, clearly uh, uh, tells us that we do have the power to not react as strongly to what we don't like for the simple fact that our life is not in danger, right? And even when somebody yells at us, we can react a little less. I mean, we're supposed to not like it because we're not like it, right? unless we're deaf and we need someone to yell so we can have hearing issues, right? Um, but there are ways to, to down-regulate, self-regulate um, into what we feel about the situation. It's not qualifying right or wrong because it's if we go right or wrong, this is where we get in trouble with the relationship. It's not right. It's not good. I don't like this. I don't like that. Well, likes and dislikes, they're such a driver in everything we do in life, but that we can manage that. If we can manage the amygdala's response, which is a big deal, we can definitely, absolutely manage it with such ease what we like and don't like and learn how to communicate that in a way in which is not offensive to the other people. So fate brought up a good, a good way to communicate. My way to communicate in instances when <laughs> there are a little heated instances is to not use the word you. So you have you already have two ways in in way in which you communicate. When you do this, like fate describes, when you do this, I feel this. And I would say, don't use the word you. So if you don't use the word you, what is left? I feel this when I am yelled at. I feel devalued when I am spoken like this. <laughs> you can use your hands to, to further communicate. And if you repeat this many times, eventually this, this other people will, will get it. Because in a heated argument, the word you can turn in, into, into escalation. Fate? Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. I is the responsible version of communication. The only person that I can speak about accurately is me, right? I can make assumptions about you and I can make my own interpretations and form my own opinions about you. And a lot of people do that and it can be tempting to do that. But the only person that I really can speak to with any amount of authority in the responsible responsible version is myself using the pronoun I and absolutely that is the best pronoun to use in fact in my first book that I wrote the conflict pattern revealed it talks about a pattern of communication that I named the gauntlet and in the gauntlet the sentences begin primarily with the word you <laughs> you're lazy you're selfish you're controlling you just care about your job you this, you that, and you always, you never. There are a list of things that people tend to say when they are upset or stressed, and it can feel accurate in the moment. It can make a, a person can feel like, well, of course you are this. Um, and again, you could be correct, but you might not be. And when it comes to conflict resolution, the sentences beginning with you, they're escalating they escalate, they're inflammatory, they cause a person to feel accused. 
and they don't lead to a solution, which actually is what people want. And when you bring up the amygdala, one of the reasons the dynamic happens and that pattern happens is that under pressure, it's a natural instinct to want to get the pressure off of me. And if I'm feeling uncomfortable because I feel disrespected, which is my own right right to feel however I need to feel about whatever circumstance, if that feels uncomfortable, it can be an unconscious thing to take the pressure off of me and throw it onto you because now it's your fault and you're to blame. And on some weird level that can get the pressure off of me. Um, but again, it's not functional, it's dysfunctional. And we can learn to downregulate the nervous system. You brought that up really well. The emergency personnel people walk into situations every single day that are triggering. Uh, the paramedics, the firefighters, they see things that are very difficult on the nervous system. And yet in those moments of pressure, they learn emotional fitness which is like any other kind of fitness that a person can learn through practice. They downregulate so that they can function in the moment. People who do martial arts or any kind of extreme sports, even the equestrian sports where, there, where there's a lot of natural adrenaline because of speeds, we can learn emotional fitness so that we can downregulate the nervous system so that we can respond instead of react and keeping that pronoun I in the forefront is an absolutely wonderful way to do it. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, this, these are very good points. Um, but what's very little talked about uh, when it comes to relationship is the relationships at work. And this relationship, they bring out a lot of, a lot of stress and a lot of uh, difficulties. And when we are at work, uh, with the boss or with the clients, uh, we have we have a different identity. Uh, our identity it's not name and 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 your identity card or your passport. Uh, it's not limited to that. But at work we are required to perform certain tasks, and when we are bombarded with with a plateful. Uh, sometimes it's because the technology doesn't work well, uh, the boss is not aware and the boss keeps throwing you things on your plate uh, and then you get upset with your boss. Um, and the language that you use at work, it's a completely different language that you use at home with, with your significant other. And at work, if we begin to understand that the boss has a boss, and the boss's boss is a boss, and the boss's boss, boss, boss is a boss. There's all kinds of bosses at work. Even if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a solopreneur, your boss would be your client. If, if, <laughs> if you don't get along with your client, then it's, you're not gonna have the client. And if you have a boss, a manager or a supervisor or whatever, you have to get along with them and understanding that they have a long list of tasks to do, which includes your task that they need to monitor and they need to report on what's done and what's the progress. Um, they will automatically take pressure off of you. It's not that the boss is mean and doesn't understand the issues that you're going through. Uh, it's just that they have a job to do that they are held responsible for. And on the other aspect, when you have issues at work, the computer breaks down, the printer doesn't work, uh, the people are not getting back, you're waiting on other people to finish their task so you can finish your task, then who do you go to? You go to your boss. So your boss is nice to you, but your boss will also be demanding of you. And so is the client. The client pays you to deliver. So the boss, you are being paid by your boss as boss and a lot of bosses, <laughs> top of bosses that generate the, 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 the inside the payroll. So we are there to deliver something. 
And this is actually such a good relationship exercise and emotional fitness when it comes to identity as well, because this automatically pushes you in knowing yourself in the relationship to your boss or to your clients and knowing that you have to deliver. And what happens after we are done with work, we come home and then we are tired of exercising the identity and we are tired of the proper way of expressing it and the proper way of engaging with the other that we come home and we talk to our significant other and, and children and, and parents in an unmanaged way. And we let our stress out on them and that's, that's a no-no, it's absolute no-no. So you brought up some really good points. The work dynamic can be challenging because it's a hierarchy. And just like the parental system is a hierarchical system, so is the kind of management systems that so many companies employ, where there is power over and um, like there, there's different layers, if you will, of responsibility and power and leadership. So when you're discussing the role of someone who is in a management position or who is like the boss, and that person may also be um, under the, you know, they may, they may also have someone that they speak, that they are, that they report to. It can be a little bit tricky because sometimes people may feel caught in the middle between different layers. And just like parents in a leadership role, we have people who are pretty good at it and are pretty good parents and they know how to do it well and set limits and boundaries and et cetera. And there are other people out there who are parents who do it very, very poorly. So depending on the situation that a person is in within a work environment, they may be in a positive supportive structure and they may be in one that's actually a little dysfunctional itself. That can be a challenge. So the word professionalism is a really great word, another great adjective about how can a person conduct themselves at work in such a way that regardless of the role they play, and myself, I've had roles from being a cashier to being a hostess at a restaurant to being the feed clean stable muck girl um, at a horse barn, I've been the lead facilitator for teen trainings, training other trainers, I've been a teacher, I've been so many different things. And in every single position, regardless of where it fits in that hierarchy, if a person can compose themselves with a degree of professionalism as best they can, that, that way of being will often serve you well. And when you talk about coming home, and I think the don't do this, right, but the phrase that the kind of the stereotype is come home and kick the dog because we're really mad at our boss, um, which I'm sure nobody would actually do that, but maybe come home and vent at our significant other or be short fused or at that kind of thing, we can transfer the frustration we feel in one place to vent it somewhere else in a safer place. But doing that is really not such a safe thing to do because the person who's being unloaded on doesn't really deserve it. But the reason that can happen is that in that professional way of being, we don't always have the freedom to say, you know what you just said to me? <laughs> I feel really disrespected right now. Right? I feel pressured. I feel like the deadline is too short. A person may not feel safe in their employment to be able to express their how they feel. So it, it is a very tricky dynamic. And I understand why it is that people sometimes have some confusion or not really sure how to manage things in a professional environment. Yes, and one something I'd like to bring out is this from multiple roles, we learn so much uh, and we add so much to our identities. And there are so many different skill sets that we learn from uh, these multiple roles. And something that is very little touched uh, upon 
is a bilingual people. And what happens with bilingual people uh, is that they have an automatic mechanism of mapping. Uh, there is a relationship, uh, a complicated relationship in mapping. And oftentimes in dynamic where only one participant is bilingual, the other participant will have a hard time or a slower time understanding where the bilingual comes from. Because from a bilingual, there's always multiple ways to say things. First of all, because of their bilingual, you can say the same thing in, in languages in different ways. And sometimes languages they use, you can use the same word in different languages, we can mean uh, different things. So when a bilingual uh, asks for more clarification is not because they don't understand it or because they're dumb, right? And um, most significantly people with an accent, they're not dumb, they usually speak several languages, but because they have this automatism of understanding things from at least two or three perspectives, so they would need a little more clarification. What do you mean? And would you like it on a left or on a right? Would you like fries with that or just ketchup or a cherry on top? And clarification is very important. And it's not, it's not hard to get clarification. Uh, on that. And even by the mere fact of asking, how do you mean? Not necessarily what do you mean? How do you mean? When you war use the word how, H-O-W, you bring out, automatically, you bring out solutions to the problems. Well, pessimists will bring out problems to any solution, but just by asking the word how you bring out solutions to, to the problems. And it's the fact that we are multi-skilled. I like to bring all of the skills that I have from different areas of life, from different roles. I've had many different roles, just like Faith uh, mentioned, she has a lot of different roles. Um, it's such a valuable, um, it's so valuable to use within your identity, within your relationship with others, the way you communicate. Uh, and to not, to, to not feel lesser than or diminished by someone with a title that has a lot of letters after their, after their name because that happens a lot. And when someone is heavily academically trained, their identity becomes the knowledge that they have. And because it's such a popular, it's such a popular behavior to present themselves as I am this and this, and this is my academic achievement, people that are trained uh, in, in multi-skills, uh, in, in different, like emotional quotient, emotional intelligence, for example, that doesn't require academic training, they might feel put off by it. And um, I heavily advise everybody within that identity to not be put off uh, by it, because having exposure to uh, several fields to several roles in, in several uh, uh, areas of life, it's actually such a benefit and brings out an enhanced skill set that you can use in, in many different ways. And if I go back to a bilingual, bilinguals also need to understand that someone that's not bilingual, they don't have an automatism of multi, multi-level, multi-dimensionality and seeing things a different way because they haven't mapped their brain like that. There was no need for them to do this automatic mapping. So us bilingual need to be a bit patient with someone that it's not bilingual and maybe express that, oh, this could be done in multiple ways. Which way would you like it? Well, when you're talking about clarification, 
um, one of the best examples that I have is air travel. Air travel for as many planes fly on any given day, carrying however many thousands and thousands of people, the amount of accidents that occur in air travel as compared to other forms of travel like automobiles is stunning as to being the highest level of safety that there is. And it turns out that my husband is a professional international airline pilot. And one day in flying around with him, he also has a very small plane that he flies on his own. And I'm in the plane and he's talking to the person on the other end saying like, um, left turn on final and the other person uh, this isn't right so if you're listening to this and you're cringing because I get the lingo wrong I'm not a pilot he is and the other person on the other end says okay turn left on fi final and he's like turning left now on final and and I'm thinking don't you know what you're doing <laughs> the person's telling you what to do you're repeating it back and and so when I got on the ground you know he let me know that in the airline industry when the tower says turn right the pilot says turning right and they repeat like a parrot every single instruction that's given and the tower repeats the same instruction back when my husband says the name of his airplane which is letters and numbers he calls the tower this is abc123 and the tower says abc123 and repeats it back and so there's communication and there is miscommunication. And when I was listening to you speak about the differences between people who speak one language versus people who speak multiple languages, there is still communication, which is when everyone agrees upon the message that was intended, right? That's basically what communication is versus miscommunication. I may be intending to tell you that you look amazing today. And if if somehow that comes across that I, I didn't say that, then that's a miscommunication. And it's so easy for normal everyday people to have misunderstandings simply because of miscommunications. So that clarification it's when you say, you know, to not feel bad or stupid for having clarification, I would encourage, yes, I agree with you completely and feel good about it. Feel like you are at the highest level. The airplane controllers, the, the airline controllers, they are at the tip of the top. I think people give a lot of credit to pilots, but who actually directs the pilots? It's the air traffic controllers that are juggling multiple planes on multiple screens all over the place, and they do it exceptionally well. And how do they do that? They clarify every single communication that comes in so that misunderstandings are ideally brought to zero so that there are no issues that arise that could have been prevented. So it's a very high level thing to do. Yes, clarity is, is definitely one of the most important thing. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people don't have clarity over their identity. And sometimes they forget to, to shift into the identity needed, whether at work or at home. Um, and feeling good about your identity and, and what needs to be done um, is definitely the, the best way to, to go about it. Assuming that you can do no wrong by always communicating with clarity, just like described in, a, in, in a air traffic, uh, 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 repeating back what was said to you um, in a nice in a nice manner, not in a not in a sarcastic way. Because if you go to sarcasm, it's just you messed it all up. Um, that helps, but also having clarity over over what the emotions are communicating to you in the relationship and in not in an argument, but in, in engaging through that relationship, there's a constant internal communication to you. And sometimes you might need to just take a two or three minutes break if you clearly understand what your physical body is, is telling you. 
And even with that, there are, I'm teaching fearfulness techniques and observational skills, which help people better understand this internal communication um, that comes to them, but also there is a way to communicate back internally to you. That even if you feel a little frazzled in, in the moment, um, because of some sparkle that you've been stressed and a little sparkle uh, uh, triggered you, there are ways quickly to, to shift into a specific state, which I teach generating state, that help, well, helps with downregulating right away, but helps with creating an environment in that relationship, which brings clarity and togetherness. And these are not small skills to, to go about because when you learn to generate a state, you these are the most advanced skills one can learn. You learn how to generate a state that's appropriate for that circumstance. Like in an air traffic control, the, the state of clear communication, it's absolutely needed, right? The air traffic controller, you're right, nobody, nobody knows about them. Everybody praises the pilots for doing a good job, but a pilot cannot do a good job without the air traffic controller. Why? There are no clear roads up there in the air, right? At least down here on earth, we have roads which are clearly defined, but up in the air, it's just air and clouds. <laughs> And it, you would be surprised there actually are different routes, if you will, and different altitudes that people do fly at in order to, if you're heading one direction, you stay at a certain height so that the person going the other direction is at a different height, um, which, by the way, when you do pass each other, it is a thrill, <laughs> but what you don't want is this, right? But it, But you're right in that it's not the same as being on the same road together and to have the guidance and direction to know where you are in a space at any given time is exactly what needs to happen. You're exactly right. The, the such a good metaphor of flying uh, underneath in the air where there are no clear uh, uh, road defines, but there are numbers to which you're at an altitude at a speed. And when you fly underneath, it's, uh, that's a trail. This is what we need to do in relationships. Sometimes someone is going to be on top and someone is going to be under. It doesn't mean that someone is minimized. And oftentimes when we want to diffuse a situation, you want to go under and you're not going under with your identity. Your identity is not being diminished. All you do, you go under the, 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 the strong emotions. And when you do that, you actually help uh, with your amygdala. Right. Parents, parents do that all the time. Parents know how to do that. They learn quickly how to see, especially with young children, that the young child is just melting down. It's hot or they're tired or hungry and they're just upset. And parents get so good at soothing them and they're there. It'll be OK. Or giving them a or, you know, giving themselves a little break, but not responding at the same level as the upset child, the parent drops their own state down, just like you described, which is not a diminishment, it's actually a strength. And what's so fun about this is that mirror neurons are real mirroring is real modeling is real. So as one person calms down, and I believe the emergency workers, they know this really well. They come to you when you're in distress and they say, everything's going to be okay. Take a deep breath. And they come to you and bring you their calmness. And right away, if you've ever been the person needing help, that can bring such relief that your own nervous system and your begins to match a little bit closer to theirs. Yes, those mirror neurons, they're, they're quite something. And this is one, one of the, the, the chemical uh, responses that happen automatically uh, in a human body it, through generating a state. Uh, mirror neurons will be responsible, so to speak, of transferring that state to the one in front of you, especially 
uh, as a, a therapist, as a practitioner, as, as a, anything engaging with a client, anything engaging with someone in front of you, if you learn how to generate a state and transfer that positive enhancing, appropriately enhancing in a moment, uh, a state, um, it will do wonder for, it will do wonder and actually adds to your identity because you know you've done something to not to de-escalate anything because you don't always need to de-escalate. Sometimes you need to enhance and sometimes you need to create an appropriate environment. And through generating states, uh, once you learn how to generate a few states and, and you work with, with certain uh, evocative words, um, everything else becomes flawless and, and seamless and there are no arguments anymore it's just togetherness and just smooth flow and uh, your identity is just completely full even someone even if someone were to insult you you would not take it as an insult you would just take it okay let's just let's just move on to to what would be more fruitful out of this uh, particular uh, uh, engagement. And, and if it doesn't bring to any fruit, you just know how to step back um, respectfully without having your identity chipped. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've discussed so much today and it's been such a pleasure to talk about needs and identity and our nervous system and the amygdala, how to de-escalate rather than escalate, how to respond rather than how to react. And um, it's just really been a pleasure to speak with you again, as it always is, and to learn more about your techniques with feelfulness that helps people to regulate their state and bring about different states by choice which again is so remarkable to have the freedom of choice with our emotions, because I think so many of us are clear that we do have a lot of choice and a lot of empowerment around our thoughts. But so many people feel um, just at the whim of our own emotions. I know I have before where the work that you do, the important work helps a person to learn that they can create these states by choice rather than be only acted upon by them by accident. Yeah, that, that's true. And this doesn't mean that we're never going to be at the whim of the emotion because sometimes we are and sometimes we're supposed to be. And, you know, when, when our life is in danger, we want to be at the whim of the emotion of, of anger and having adrenaline flow over the body to, to have the strength to get out of the situation. But to be at the whim of our emotions all the time and all the time, it's, it's, it's not uh, healthy. So uh, be on the lookout for our uh, online events. Uh, we're going to send you an, an invite, a link to our uh, free event to um, have you ask us questions that we can address as far as uh, identity and relationships and dancing well with, with the other in, in, in front of us. Um, and we look forward to having you on board. All right. It'll be great to answer everyone's questions. So yeah, keep your eye out for the invitation. All right, thank you everybody. We'll see you next time.